Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to have you all here. And I just see that uh, our last participants are coming in. We close the door. Thank you very much. Um, Warm well, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, because I see uh, when I look here in the crowd, there are more ladies than gentlemen. So that's great because this topic today will be about that. Uh, my name is Cornelius. I'm uh, working for Team Alicia. I'm responsible for the Partnership and Sustainability Program, and I'm your host today. And I'm gonna guide you through the evening. Um, a couple of housekeeping topics. Um, first of all, sound check. I think that works. Check the box. Um, if you get thirsty, um, we have a bar right behind the stairs. Uh, stay hydrated. It's a really warm day, um, and I don't want to have any emergencies here again. <laughs> um, thank you for 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 coming. Um, we will have a panel discussion, and I'm very thankful, especially to welcome our panelists, our distinguished speakers. Um, we will have a panel discussion around in like 15 minutes, and then. Um, taking questions from the audience, maybe like going down with the sound a bit because I hear this beep. All right, thank you, Miguel. Um, and then, of course, please stay on um, after the panel discussion because we will have some networking drinks um, until 7 p.m. Also, one welcome. I face now the camera because also one welcome to our folks that are following this uh, panel discussion online. Um, also, if you have to step out. Um, for any reason, we will re record this uh, this panel, so you can also have already the chance to uh, yeah watch it again um, on our website on our YouTube channel. Um, first of all, I would like to get into the ocean mood, um, and that's why I want to ask you to pull out your cell phones and scan the barcode and answer this very simple question. Think about the ocean. What one word comes to your mind? Um, get inspired and I will give you a couple of minutes and then we want to see the results. Is there a Wi-Fi code? I don't know, this lady asked for it. Is there a Wi-Fi code? No? I can, maybe I can show my, just use my, uh, my hotspot. Oh, you, you can use it. It's Cornelius. What's that? All right, the code is like 1884223. You go on slider.com and then it should show up. And let's see the results. Oh, there we go. Freedom. Somebody. <laughs> okay, there's definitely like one. Maybe you. Whoever was this, like, picking the code, maybe you do it again. <laughs> Love, important, fierce, vast, waves, big. So the more people, like, picking the same word, the bigger the cloud, of, of course, gets. So the ocean rays, nature, endlessness, whales, power, breath, peace, race, vast. I give you a couple more seconds, one more minute. Anyone else? Crunch time. Blue climate. Two more typing. Health big. Life itself, our hero. <laughs> okay, so it's say like 10 more seconds. Count down. On. Nature, heroin, <laughs> wild. Okay, I think we have a winner here. It's freedom. Um, on the podium we have vast, and I would say big. That's great. So thank you for thank you for that. Um, can we go back to the to the slide? 
Tak. Tak. You get it? Can you help me? No. One more back. Exactly. Because before I start, you know, warming up for the topic that we have today uh, on the stage, it's so important, like, to catch your brains, to catch your emotions, because this is what drives us forward. This is our team. This is Team Malice. And um, of course, the focus is always on the sailors and on the boat, but we are a much bigger team, um, onshore, offshore crew, and uh, um, we're coming from all kinds of different directions, different backgrounds, different biographies. Uh, and of course, we also have uh, almost a gender equality in our team. I think um, compared to the other teams, we are quite advanced on that. But more importantly, we have one mission, we have one goal, we have one campaign that actually ties us together because we are all excited and passionate about the ocean. We want to protect the ocean, we want to protect our planet and that's why um, we actually prepared a little video and Boris, our head skipper, our main skipper and founder of the team will explain to you why it is so important to engage in that mission. This is my job, my passion, but of course I depend on the ocean. This is my workplace and uh, to do my fascinating sport that I love, I need them to be preserved. And the biggest threats for the wildlife, the biodiversity on the oceans and in the oceans is climate change. The oceans get warmer due to the man-made global warming. They have dropped 93% of the excess heat, profoundly changing biology and chemistry in the oceans and being a huge threat to biodiversity. against time and we shouldn't forget over all the science and debates and discussions that we know clearly what to do. This is a decade where we have to turn around. We need to cut emissions fast. To tackle climate change is of course one of the biggest challenges for humanity at the moment, but it's also a challenge for the best ideas and for the fastest pace because it's a race against time and it's a race we must win. Good to be back in nature. Let's see what's the next challenge. I think I'm standing like not in the right way to have connection with our. Now it seems to work. So we we hear the figures, right? So actually, uh, it's quite important always to mention that we are living on a blue planet over 70% is covered by water. So we always say like, we always have the reference to planet Earth, but it's actually planet ocean. And then, Boris mentioned in this video, um, the uh, CO2 emissions, the climate crisis is the most pressing and urgent crisis that we have on Earth, a bottleneck crisis. And of course, uh, why? Because the oceans are absorbing um, a good third of the CO2, um, and over 90% of the excess heat, so the industrial heat that we are emitting uh, into the air. Here. They regulate our climate. And that's why we have a bigger climate mission, a race must win climate action now. And you see here our wonderful uh, iMaka boat, uh, our Malicia Sea Explorer. And of course, what really like strikes into your eyes is the design, the colorful design of the sails and the hull. For a good reason, because those colors, of course, represent the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations essential goals that we have to achieve and to, they have to be accomplished by 2030. They have been like put up by the United Nations uh, in 2050. And um, here you see 17 goals basically to solve 
all the problems that we have on Earth. But again, these two are the bottleneck goals, planetary bottleneck goals that we have to solve. The climate crisis, we cannot solve all the other, let's say, um, societal problems like poverty if we cannot solve the climate crisis. So that's why this is our headline, this is why we have this campaign, and this is why we are racing around the world and spreading this message to inspire people, businesses, and civil society to engage and to act. And today, I'm very happy that we include one more SDG and to basically put this to the spotlight in the context of the climate crisis and the climate action activities and um, the life below water SDG, it is gender equality. So we want to talk about female leadership. We want to talk about what it takes actually to become a female leader. We want to have a definition of what is actually female leadership, whether it exists, whether we need that, and how actually this female leadership in sports, in business, or in the civil society can actually contribute to the climate action and to the mission. Um, and this is why I'm very happy now to introduce our distinguished panelists. And I ask you now to come to the stage and um, take a seat. So we have here Farah Obaidullah. She is an ocean advocate and the founder of Women for Oceans. And she is also the editor of the Ocean and Us book, which has been released last year. Oh, yeah. Listen. Listen. Second, I would uh, like to come to the stage. Monika Schulz, the head of customer and innovation management from Zurich, Group, Germany, and driver of projects such as the Planet Hero Award. We are going to hear later. Next, I have uh, Amy Sinclair with us. Um, she's the former vice president of the Women's National Women's Sailing Association. You're a passionate ocean offshore sailor, and uh, you're also the CEO and founder of Women Who Sail. Welcome to the stage. Well, and last but not least, and I think she doesn't need a big introduction here, uh, she sailed sin since she was six years old and competed in many most iconic offshore races uh, around the world and now co-skippering with our team, Team Alicia. Welcome to the stage, Rosalind Kai. <laughs> so, thanks for exactly I take a seat, I take a seat myself. Um, before we go into the discussion, I actually tried to get the next slide. Rosie, I have to ask the question. Um, you see the picture, and um, I actually ask all participants here to send me like an iconic picture of them or something that have uh, when it comes when you know what comes into your mind with female leadership. And like uh, they sent me something back. Of course, you were too busy, so I picked something for you. <laughs> but I think this is such an iconic picture of of you. Um, basically taken yesterday when the boat arrived here in, in The Hague and you're, um, you're on the boat waving the national flag and even the king and the queen were on our boat. What was the feeling? Can you describe the feeling you had exactly in that moment? So we have a little bit of a description here. Yes, uh, first of all, welcome to everyone and thanks for uh, joining this panel. Um, looking at this picture, um, it was a mental experience. Um, we have sailed in the past five months uh, over 90 days at sea. Um, and uh, for me to come into the Hague, uh, wave the national flag with the king and queen joining, uh, it was a very, very special moment. Um, I think for the whole crew, uh, we pushed ourselves in the boat so hard to, to do all of this. Uh, and this was the crown of work I've done so far and uh, very emotional. I was actually crying on the picture. <laughs> yeah. And I think it was a um this is not only like a really like an emotional moment, but it's also like something that you really have fought for. And like you were, um, you know, as I mentioned already, you were like an offshore sailor for many, many years. But this is like kind of like the crown, the cherry on the top. And um, can you describe a little bit like your career path and like you know what made you what what was the motivation to become um, that far to get that far to become like an offshore sailor and also, like, if, if possible, can you enlighten us a little bit about the barriers and the doubts you might have as a, yeah. as a female sailor? Um, well, for me, the first motivation to, uh, to try to make it into the ocean race, uh, I 
We have an echo. Can you kill the echo? Or I can put that one. Yeah? Um, no, for me, like the motivation to, to be at sea is um, because I feel so peaceful uh, when I'm out there and I'm so happy. Um, and indeed, it was a, a long way. For me, eight years ago, I, I started this dream and I, I told people, I said, okay, I want to compete in the ocean race. And 99% um, of the people that I told this, I said, we're not going to make it because you don't have enough experience, because uh, you haven't done the Olympics. But uh, my mother was the, the one who said, but if you really want something, if you really want it, then you can make it happen. Um, and this was for me the motivation. I knew I, I'm just a little girl. Oh, closer, sorry. Not Thank you. Um, and, and I have this dream, um, and I'm just going to try to make this happen. And um, for me to come into the egg like this, my dream came true yesterday. And yesterday I realized I sailed around the world in one of the best teams. Well, it's the best team. The vibe is amazing in our team. Um, and, I, and I really made it. And the past eight years, I, I really fought my way up. And there were barriers, of course. Like, um, as you all know, it's a male-dominated sport. Um, and still, 85% of the professional sport is men. Um, but for me, the possibility to join this team um, that was amazing. I got called by, by Holly Kova, she's in the back, the team director, and Boris Herman, the skipper, if I want to join this race. Um, and I actually couldn't believe my eyes. Um, it was super special, but I could never imagine that it was like this. Uh, I think in my, I, I stopped talking soon, <laughs> but in, in my way up, like, of course you see so many barriers and you're a girl of 20 years old and you sail with um, guys between 20 and 60 years old on a boat where we had more than 25 crew and then you're the only girl and try to prove yourself and really show what you can and of course you see barriers and there's a bit of disbalance um, so I'm super happy that I've made it into this team and I'm really respected I, I don't feel the only woman on the boat um, and I think that's special and you should try to yeah, keep that way and um, yeah, be more open and welcoming more girls and young talent into this sport. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so taking here the, the, the ball from, from what you just said is, uh, you know, inspiring and motivating more female sailors to, you know, engage in that sports and to become as ambitious as you were. Um, and I think there's one initiative, and I'll turn over here to you, Amy. Um, Women Who Sail is uh, a very interesting platform that actually tries to fill exactly this gap what you just have described. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like your ideas behind that and how did you start that, um, that platform and whether do you see any improvement also, um, you know, taking the debate from a society? Like, do you see any improvement from that? Yeah, so Women Who Sail is the largest online group of women sailors around the world. There's about 50,000 of us. Um, the group is, was actually started by Charlotte Kaufman, the woman in the middle there. Um, and her goal really was to just find a safe, supportive place where she could ask questions um, and, and, and feel as if she wouldn't be sort of judged or, or criticized because of her gender and the nature of the questions. Um, this group has grown dramatically, uh, and it's because of the members and their commitment to trying to make sure we create a supportive space on the water. Um, currently, right now, there's about 45 subgroups that have been created outside of the main group. It's an online group on, on, on Facebook. Um, groups are regional, so that you can create smaller groups, like there's women who sail the Med, women who sail Northern Europe. And there's also interest-based groups like women who race, um, women who are in the marine industry, things like that. Uh, and I think it's really very important to create spaces like that so we can encourage more women to come in. There are quite a few people who are in the group who have never sailed and just dream of sailing. So this creates a really encouraging place for those who are interested and want to learn more to, to find out information. I think um, our our biggest sort of mandate and uh, goal really is to create a space where people can envision themselves doing something um, and encourage more leadership. We have quite a few 
uh, women captains, women sailing instructors, women who know how to repair diesel engines. And so anytime anyone has a question, you'll see there's a flock of people who will come in and try to help them understand how to fix the head, small things. Um, and so we want to encourage more women to get into this. Uh, and, and in addition to groups like this, it also helps create a nice space for other uh, groups that are trying to learn how to start these kinds of communities. Uh, there are, are women who want to create safer spaces in their yacht clubs. There are women who want to create more female coaches. Um, so it, it just, it's, it's a wonderful place for the entire industry. Thank you. and. Uh... May I add um, another question? Because you're not only like an offshore sailor and the creator and founder of uh, Women Who Sail, but you're also an official UN spokesperson engaging in peace projects in, uh, in Nigeria, in northern Nigeria. And um, from your CV, I also learned that you were very much engaging in the African continent to bring um, sailing, and especially like female sailing, women into sailing, um, around different countries, such as in Kenya. Can you talk a little bit about these projects and where, where you stand there? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest project that I was a part of was when I met Team Malizia. Um, so I do a lot of communication consulting for the UN and was they uh, reached out to me when they wanted to bring Greta Thunberg over. Um, and they were looking to create a community of sailboats that would meet her, that they could flank with the SDGs that you saw up there, the different... Um, sustainable development goals and so I said yes absolutely and we were able to not only get the boats for this but also make sure that those boats had women and children aboard so that they can greet her as she arrived um, into the 2019 UN Climate Summit. Uh, some of the other work that I've done that has been really exciting for me is I went to Africa specifically to Kenya and to a community where for the very first time I saw people who were sailors who look like me. Um, not only am I a woman sailor, I'm also an African-American sailor, and so you don't see a lot of uh, cultural diversity in the sailing world in here in Europe or in the United States. And so for me, this was an amazing thing. Uh, but the only problem was there were no women. They were all men. Uh, and so that it became a goal of mine as I learned that they had a race, that we would create the first female women um, participating team to be in this race and so they race on these wooden dows where, which are a little bit different than, than the boats I was used to wasting, uh, racing on but the other challenge in this community was that it's a very um, traditional Muslim society where women would wear the hajib uh, and so they aren't very uh, participatory in sailing or any of the industries that drive the economic growth, which are fishing. So a lot of them don't know how to swim and don't usually even leave the house. So our challenge was to get them to come out and, and join the race and be a part of the team. And so we were told when I first got there that this would not work. There are no winches on these boats. Women were, to we were told we're not strong enough to, to trim the sails or um, uh, do any of the other jobs on the boat and that it was actually quite dangerous and that we would fall out of the boat and we would drown. Um, <laughs> so first it was convincing, you know, for, for us to get a boat in the first place, a boat owner who would allow us on and then just to encourage the women who would have never done this to get on the boat. Um, and I remember when I first got there, it was actually another, um, it was a, a wife of a one of the team members who told me that this would never work and I was like, I just hope you're there on the day of the race. I want you to be there in the front row and I will tell you that during that race, not only did we finish, we beat her husband's boat. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it was a wonderful thing because you had, I had um, women on the boat who were very shy and, and one who didn't even want to come out to lunch to meet the team. And by the end of this experience, she was saying things like, we should chant. Let's come up with a chant. And so the day of the race, we were running down the beach, and she was leading this chant. So it was so nice to see a sport that could create confidence and change a mind shift, and not just for one woman or the six or seven women who are on our team, but for an entire community. And that's when I started realizing the power of sailing and how it can be this sort of vessel to help um, create a space where women can feel like they can do anything. Thank you so much. Um, yeah.
also to add that, like, I mean, we have like quite a, a Western perspective on this topic, of course, a very Eurocentric topic, and this is also why we have to really open up and like be inclusive in these perspectives. And I think your your project and your contribution is definitely like counting on this on this account. Um, you, you just mentioned like confidence, and um, Clara, like when we talked about uh, this panel and, and we got to know each other, um, it was for me it was like really in the discussion that we had. It was it was the visibility. It was the the uh, exactly what also uh, Amy mentioned the confidence to like bring women out there and give them the stage and give them the access and give them put them on the limelight because. Um, um, this is like, you know, the self-consciousness and the confidence, this is like the, the basic uh, groundwork to um, have change in the society. And um, I think uh, what you have created with Women for Oceans is, is going into that direction. Can you talk a little bit about this project, how did you start it, and also, um, you know, where, where we stand on, on, your, on your, I think it's because it's an international NGO, where do we stand globally? Uh, when it comes to like female visibility in ocean protection. Sure. Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here, and thank you to Team Militia for inviting me today. Um, so I have been working in ocean conservation for about 20 years now, and um, and I've always been passionate about the ocean. And you know, I think everybody here has their own connection with the ocean. And in fact, I think everybody everywhere does. They just sometimes maybe need to think about what that is. And for everybody, that's different. Um, but for me, it was always just, I, I just found the ocean to be just awesome and, and uh, mysterious and fierce and, you know, just very awe-inspiring. And um, so my focus has always been about protecting the ocean. I was always concerned with climate change, always concerned with how we're treating the oceans. Um, and in these 20 years, I have been observing, you know, uh, both at the rural and community levels, but also at the international levels. I spend a lot of time in the corridors of power, like at the United Nations. Um, and what I always see is uh, a lack of female representation, uh, first and foremost, and of course a lack of cultural representation as well when it comes to global decision-making about the ocean. Um, and so as a biologist by, by training, you know, I wonder what are we doing that is so at odds with every other animal on Earth? And you know what we have done successfully across uh, you know our across generations and across the world is uh, suppress one half of our population, women. Of course, there's many other minorities that we can speak of, and I've been personally affected by a lot of the other minorities. But women, we make up half the population, and yet we are not represented in decision making equally. And that, I think, is why we are seeing a world that we are seeing today, which is quite skewed and, and is not on a, on a, on a great path. Um, so I, I set up Women for Oceans not because I was ever concerned about feminism or about women's equality. I mean, of course I was, but it wasn't my battle. You have to choose your battle, and this wasn't mine. Mine was protecting the ocean. Uh, but to do that, we actually do need gender equality and, and representation across the spectrum of humanity. And why? Because we know it from the business world. We know that if we increase our diversity, we increase our bottom line. The business world understands it. And it's the same for ocean conservation. The same is true for finding solutions to our problems today for the oceans. We need to have the diverse representation of, 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 of people at the table. Um, and I guess we're going to come to some of what, what, what that specifically means. But that's why I set up Women for Oceans, because I, I was working on a documentary series at the time, and every storyline was putting forward a white male, sorry, <laughs> but putting forward a white male as the hero of, of that particular issue, whether it was shark finning in the, in the Pacific Ocean, or slavery at sea in Southeast Asia, or dynamite fishing in East Africa. And as a change maker, I thought, well, this is flawed. We are never going to change the way we do things if we are not putting up relatable uh, heroes, or relatable people. Why would somebody in East Africa listen to a Brit telling them that we shouldn't be dynamite fishing when there's plenty of local heroes we could be elevating to do that? So that's why I set up Women for Oceans, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, in the meantime, it's grown to be quite a global network. Right, not sure we can see it, but I put on your picture here. Can you quickly describe what it was? Because I was completely misguided by that. I thought, like, it's, it's her diving next to, like, a fishing net, full one, 
and I really thought like she's gonna like cut it off and like let the fish out, like some sort of like underwater pirate. But it's I was I was wrong. Please tell everyone. Well, I mean, uh, so in terms of pirates, uh, I was not the pirate, but uh, I was on an, an expedition where we were trying to expose fish pirates at sea, so illegal and unregulated and unreported fishing, which is rife, especially in the high seas. As Cornelius said, we live on a planet ocean, over 70% is the ocean, and it's also out of sight, uh, and out of therefore out of the minds of most people. Um, and so the, the high seas in particular, but the oceans in general, are a perfect playground for illegal activities. And so our expedition at the time was to document illegal fishing, fishing happening at sea. This picture is taken at a depth of 23 meters in the western central Pacific Ocean in the high seas. The high seas are those parts of the ocean that don't belong to anyone, um, that are beyond the national jurisdiction of any one nation. This is a net full of, uh, of skipjack tuna, and, I, and that's mostly the tuna you find in uh, canned tuna, by the way. Um, and I, I chose this picture because, for me, it just it represented a very, uh, a very impactful expedition that I was leading. I'm here. I'm a safety diver on this uh, photo because I was the most uh, experienced diver on, on the ship, and I was just making sure that the 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 document, the camera crew were safe underwater. So that stick there is really um, to bump away any sharks that might come in the, you know, in the vicinity. Unfortunately, most sharks are gone. So <laughs> that was really an issue on that trip. But, um, and actually, I, you know, I'd be happy to tell you later about, you know, some of the really, uh, you know, impactful things that I, ha that happened actually in that net. You see it's full of fish, right? But at one point, a foot um, was protruding, a human foot was protruding, yes, a human foot was protruding from that net. I have, have old slideshow photos about this. But, um, and as an expedition leader, I thought, oh, you know, uh, what are we going to do? There's a body in a net, we're on the high seas. I, you know, as expedition leader, I have to come up with a solution to this. Then uh, a few seconds later, I saw the rest of the body, and it was, in fact, a fisherman, alive and well, uh, at this depth, and he had uh, just a small tube, no regulator, just a small tube going up to the surface, 23 meters up. He had no buoyancy control device. He was wearing goggles, not a mask. Um, and he wasn't wearing fins or any protective gear. And he is in this uh, net of tuna, corralling the fish into this smaller net, which is then scooped up on the deck. Um, but it, it really, uh, for me, the, the, apart from the illegal fishing that was happening, uh, it was also the human rights abuse at sea. There's no way, I mean, there was me privileged with all the safety equipment I could think of to take down underwater, even a stick to ward off sharks, which are overfished. Um, but then there's this man with no protection whatsoever, and he was very kind enough to let me go on board the ship afterwards to show me how uh, the generator worked, which was completely rust, you know, disaster, um, and just the conditions on board. Um, and that's, that's maybe another story, but that's why I chose this picture. Thank you, thank you. And also, I would just want to use the opportunity to... Yeah, I have it here in my hands. Maybe you're going to mention it later. But this is such an inspiring book, um, what you wrote, uh, with co well, I, I put together, you yes. You put it together, yes. but also like you wrote quite yes. some, some, some content for that. It's a compendium of like fascinating uh, women um, in all kinds of sectors, science, ocean conservancy, uh, governance. Um, it is also about gender equality. And actually, um, the preparation for this panel for me was like this one chapter about inclusiveness, about uh, gender diversity, and like um, what you just mentioned, and, and your mission, what you pursue with the Women for Ocean. So I can really recommend you to, to buy this book. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's also with pictures, wonderful pictures, not that, that crazy uh, picture here with the crazy story, but um, it's really fascinating, and I can really recommend you to to buy this. Um, let's move on to the business sector. Uh, this thing doesn't work at all. Yeah, to, uh, I gotta give you the sign. Um, Monica, now we have you here, and uh, you in the preparation of the of this panel. Um, as I said, I wanted to. Um, you know, receive pictures and iconic photographs, and you have selected this one. Why exactly? I'm the lady in pink today, and by the way, I'm not the only one from the insurance industry wearing pink here, yeah? so <laughs> we're good here. Uh, and the reason why I'm wearing pink, I'm sorry about the black t-shirt, I would have loved to wear it wrong, is because it's a symbol 
uh, for our industry a little bit to say, uh, we are different, we are self-confident, we take action. Uh, I joined the insurance industry 15 years ago, and my first leadership team meeting was an ocean of gray and dark blue. Ocean of, I mean, you could hardly find any woman, and I know that we had a party on a boat, yeah, so I entered this boat, and I can still remember I was quite scared, because I'm like, oh my god. Yeah. So 15 years later, we're still not in a, in a stage where we can say, I mean, we see the steps. We see that if you have more women in leadership positions, you have better results. We're still not there. You know? we're still, if you look at the numbers, it still is such that we don't have a lot of women in leadership positions. But I think that we are more self-confident today. Yeah? So it is more about wearing bright colors. And I attended a female uh, uh, conference the other day from the finance industry. Uh, and we had a lot of bright colors, not only blue, but blue and whatever. So I think we're changing, um, but we are still in a very male-dominated world as well. And I have to say, I lived in Sweden, I lived in uh, the Netherlands for some uh, time, uh, and I never had the feeling that I have to fight for female rights, and it's not my thing either, to be honest. Yeah? Today I have to say, because I have three girls, you know, uh, today I have to say, I started at least raising some questions and raising the awareness that there are some, still some hurdles for women uh, we have to overcome. Uh, and self-confidence is one of them. Yeah? I mean, a lot of women don't have the self-confidence to get to men. Uh, unconscious bias, uh, biases is another one. Uh, and then this whole thing about combining career uh, and uh, family is, is one which is, by the way, getting more difficult for men as well, because I, I talked to a lot of men who said, I don't dare to stay at home and you know, take care of my children, because I have the feeling that it's a dead end for my career. So it is something which we have to take care of if we are serious. So how do we raise a family if we just push it uh, onto a woman? Uh, or respectively, I know a lot of men now who say, I want to take care of children as well. Why not? Uh, and um, I mean, just a small anecdote, I went to the school of my little daughter the other day uh, and one of the mothers said to me, oh, you are the mother of Lily. I said, yes, I'm the mother of Lily. Yeah. We haven't seen here, you here yet. Yeah? So, I mean, it was clearly a connotation of, oh, you're a bad mother. Yeah? Uh, and uh, my, my husband is doing a great job and he's happy. Yeah? So what is the problem? Yeah? Uh, but it's still a very German way uh, as well, living. And there's a German word called Rabenmutter, which is, how do you translate it? Raven mother. Raven mother, a yeah. Bad mother. Um, and having lived a little bit also in, in Switzerland, I think there are some countries uh, who are, which are a bit more advanced, like Sweden, for example. But we still have a lot of uh, hurdles for women to overcome, even in business, and this is why I like <laughs> Nice, nice one. Uh, but what is your definition, or what would be your definition for female leadership? Do we have like, in maybe in, in contrast, a male leadership, and what is maybe like the, the, you know, what are the benefits or the values coming out from female leadership? Uh, there's a Harvard business study where you can look at a lot of skills uh, you have to have if you're a lead, or you should have if you're a leader. And if you compare male and female. Uh, uh, females are always better than men in most of the skills. There are two where men are better. One is technical expertise, and the other one is strategic thinking. Yeah? And strategic thinking is good, technical expertise as well. But one thing I really like is also strategy into action. Yeah? Because if you don't get into action, yeah, you can strategize until the cows come home, sorry. Uh, you have to get into action as well, because otherwise, yeah, I mean, we draw a PowerPoint, yeah? and we have to do something. And when it comes to climate, I think at the time of talking is over, we have to do something. Absolutely, yeah. Rosie, like you have been with like um, mostly men on the boat. Um, and Dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an applause, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, like. I mean, like living on a boat, um, 34 days in the Southern Ocean, just surrounded by men. Um, I mean, like, did you like 
I mean, you get along, obviously, um, but like, were there like sometimes days where you thought like, oh, these guys, like, they drive me nuts, and like, again, they're like, just like having a man's talk, or was there anything, like any situation where you thought like, oh, this is, this is not going, going to be well, or did you feel completely comfortable and safe and yeah. surrounded by good crew members? Yes, I 100% felt like this. Um, the funny thing is, it's, you mentioned it now, and I always say like, oh, I feel a woman when on the shore the media is asking me how is it the only woman on the boat? Um, and to be clear, when we're sailing, when you're out on the ocean, um, you follow the rules of nature and you follow the rules at sea. And if you follow the rules of nature, it doesn't matter if you're a woman or a man, you're exactly the same. And you do the same four things, you eat, shit, sleep and sail. Um, and maybe you do it a little bit in a different way, but uh, we have an amazing crew and we are so tolerant and we just, uh, we have equal roles. Um, and so I've, no, I've not had one single moment that I thought, oh guys, come on. It's just, it's easy going, it's relaxed, we respect each other as a person, as sailors, as just yeah, human beings. And there's no, for me there's no difference in being a wet man or, I have to say I don't know how it is to sail with a fully man crew, of course, because I'm not a man. Um, but it's it's good like it is. Yeah. I think we can learn a lot. What you just said, maybe like to just highlight this again. I mean, as we human beings, uh, you know, we're all the same. We should understand each other uh, as like, you know, the same creatures. And also, this is I think the source of respect for each other because we, you know, we come from nature. We go back to nature. It doesn't matter which you know uh, which sex you're born in or which gender you're born in or which society you're born in. We all are you know one humanity. I think that's. That's quite important what you mentioned, especially learning that from the elements when you are exposed to the elements at sea, you know, you will be like, you're very small as a human being and surrounded by uh, We are nothing. Force. We're like nothing. When we sailed from uh, Brazil to, uh, sorry, from Cape Town to Brazil, that was 36 days at sea, and we are just weeks in the Southern Ocean and it's grey and you just realize how small you are as a person. And you have so much respect for the ocean, you have so much respect for the albatrosses who are living there, you just realize, oh, we can survive here. Like we, we're just such a tiny little spot on the earth, and it's um, it's amazing to to build respect for the ocean like this. I really, in this race, my my eyes are open for the power of nature. And I think there's also a lot of respect coming from your uh, fellow crew members because you are the one climbing up together with Will, climbing up the mast and fixing the the rip that we had in the mast. Um, how was it for you, like, like being suddenly like in a position where you really like, you know, help the crew to go on with the race and like to be, you know, out there, up there, actually, like 30 meters, surrounded by high sea states, and like, um, did you get seasick actually on that on that situation at some point? Or luckily not that situation, but uh, every first uh, two days of the legs, I'm a bit sick, um, but you forget the bad things. Um, but no, that, that moment was a, a big moment for the whole crew. Um, and you really, you put your life in each other's hands. Um, and we are all professional, you train hard uh, to be ready for these kind of moments. So when, when we had the big rip in the mast, uh, the mast is 27 meters high, and we had like a, like a carbon rip, uh, and we had to, to fix it. Um, and at that moment, yeah, you just, you just do what you think is good, and the whole crew gave like 100% to make this happen because we had only one chance. We had limited amount of carbon, limited amount of glue. So we made a big plan and we prepared for well, 10 hours with everything in the right place. And at one point we, we started the timer. We had 45 minutes because the glue is drying and everyone has a specific role. Will was up the mast, uh, Boris and myself were laminating, and Nico was sailing the boat. And we just knew like we, we need to do it now. And uh, yeah, in the end we managed, and in the end we, uh, we finished this leg first, so it was a big victory for us that moment. I can't imagine, yeah. Uh, it's quite a memorable moment actually for all of us, I think uh, uh, this, this and also like your injury you had, uh, this was like quite like some, some shock moments, but at the same time we could really like, you know, have witnesses the, uh, the team power that was behind that. It was the team, on. there was 100% the team power, yeah. and uh, for, for us this was just like, that we could make this happen if you're a male or female, it doesn't matter, you just give everything what you have to to, to make it successful and uh, I think we did super well and we got so close as a team uh, and 
by this the spirit got lifted up and we're just you know we from Alicante from the start we tried to smash it but I think that moment really brought us together and now we're sailing like brothers and sisters around the world. Mm -hmm. right. I'm allowed to ask a question. So what do you believe why we still don't have a lot of women in sailing crews? Is it because you need some physical strength as well and that's why we need more men than women? Because I just learned that need more women in sailing as well, or is it something else, or is it not that we don't have enough women who are brave enough? Well, I think if you just look back in the day, so say 100 mm -hmm. years ago, it was the men who were going out at sea, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, traveling out around the world, what you say, like the woman uh, stayed home and taking care of the kids. Um, but I think that's changing, um, and I just had a chat with Abby Ehler, she's sailing on wholesale, and she's She is the generation who really fought, like who really tried to make the way for, for girls like me, like the younger generation. Um, and you see it's the, the sport is getting more open and there's more access for, for young people and, and females. But if you look at this post, these armokas, um, it's a mix between men and machine. Uh, sorry, human and machine, not only men. Um, <laughs> And so actually the physical part, it's a fact that a female in general is less strong than a man. That's just a fact. Um, well, not all, you know, but uh, in these boats it doesn't matter so much. We can sail these boats with four women and that would be as competitive as sailing it with four men. Um, so yes, I think the future of sailing, it's just, we can do this. And I think there are a lot of women brave enough, but we should start um, inspiring the younger generation and try to um, get them into the offshore sailing and try to be open with all the teams and have uh, like women we need the power so you need the partners and we have a female team director and she's empowering people so I think in the sailing sport in the offshore sailing sport we need more women who, who can make the decisions like you uh, who can collect more and more uh, female to to prove themselves and to just live in this world. Can I, can I also yeah, add something to that? I think what, what you shared is really important. Uh, representation really matters. It's really wonderful to be on this panel with all these women who have done such amazing things in their respective industries, but as a woman and or any group, it is very hard to envision yourself into a future where you do not see yourself. So what I would share is that I think it's really important for any woman who's in any industry to make sure that they make themselves visible. I know self-promotion sometimes is very difficult, but you don't know who's watching you, who you are inspiring next. So this uh, female mentorship is also just as important. Uh, a lot of times I'm asked questions like, oh, how can we get more girls out on the water? And how can we do more things like this? I think. It's just important to be visible um, uh, and to put yourself in positions where you can um, become an instructor or maybe, uh, for instance, you can help create a pathway in an academic situation where there's more uh, women looking to become uh, interested in these career paths. And then just by the nature of, of speaking about these things and then having teams like Melitzia and then different um, sailing events making it a priority to mandate that women are on board, that's also part of it. So I think we're, we're on the right track. We just need to do more. I encourage me this. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm hearing a, a lot of uh, great statements here, and I think we learned a lot. Um, turning a little bit like a discussion into the climate action direction, and I think Monica, because we're working very close together on, on different projects. Um, um, Zurich is one of our partners, and uh, we have set up together the Planet U Award. And I remember um, previous to my time, starting at uh, Team Malizia in 2020, um, there was a Planet U Award in uh, 2021, where uh, an NGO won the prize. Um, it was Reefs. And uh, they actually like uh, one of the one most fascinating NGOs rebuilding coral reefs around the world. And um, also most of the, the co-workers there, the, the, the colleagues are women. And um, from your personal experience, Monica, did you have any, um, I would say, yeah, do you see any advantages um, to change the, the, the notion and the debate about climate action 
and be to become more female. Do you think that female empowerment um, in terms of climate action would help the planet? Because I also remember that you were posting something on LinkedIn recently, a nice book that I can recommend, it's only in German, another book, we have a lot of books today, um, um, that a woman actually will save the planet. Um, would you agree with that? And like, how do you work in Zurich to pursue that? I mean, first of all, I believe that we have to do something differently because it didn't work yet. Yeah? And as you said, we don't have enough women yet in, in uh, powerful positions. But I also believe in, and I said it earlier, this inaction. Yeah? Start, stop talking, do something. Yeah? And this is why we created the so-called Planet Hero Awards together with uh, Boris, who said we want to help NGOs uh, help meaning we coach them, give them business advice, but they also get money from us. Uh, and that's something which is really fascinating because we started it in 2021. And in the beginning I was like, yeah, let us see and what happens. And we have some great projects coming up. Reefs is one of them. I mean, they're using 3D printers in order to recreate reefs. Uh, and I think that's something which is fascinating. They now started rebuilding reefs in, in, in uh, certain ocean areas. The second one I find really fascinating is uh, Water 3.0. Uh, they take microplastic out of the water. And if you listen to their presentations, I mean, you cannot drink water anymore. You have microplastic in everything we drink uh, and everything we handle. And I think that's something which is really fascinating. And after the first award ceremony, we looked on stage, it was only women. And I'm like, okay, how does this come now? I mean, how, why do we only have women on stage? And then uh, some weeks later, we had a startup uh, Zurich Innovation Championship uh, uh, celebration. Yeah? Uh, and they are 90% women again. Yeah? So there seems to be something which is different between NGOs and making money quickly, uh, to put it like that. Yeah? Uh, and I think that we have to encourage more women have have to have more positive examples, as you said, uh, to go forward and then also help them to be funded uh, and, and go forward. That's something I really believe in and the companies have a role to play as well. So I, I see politics, of course. I see the companies and I see each of us individually as well. Uh, and this is why we created a so-called Planet Hero platform uh, we now have the Planet Hero Award. Uh, we have a video series where we uh, hold up our hands and say, look, uh, we have a challenge here, we have to do something. Microplastic is one of them, uh, saving the oceans, and we have different topics. Uh, and then also we have something which we call uh, Planet Hero Coach, daily tips and tricks, what you can do in your daily life. Because I also believe that we personally have to do something. It's not about delegating to companies or delegating to politics. We have to do something as well. So it's, it's I hear a lot of people who say, yeah, but I'm so small, I cannot do anything. If everybody believes that, I think we're in trouble as well. So we have to do something. Uh, yeah. You want to add something to that? No, I, I just wanted to say just generally this male-female discussion. Um, you know, I, I, I don't look at it in those terms. I look at it more in terms of uh, our, our, our feminine side, which all of us possess, right? But we have somehow reached a point where we only reward uh, certain traits which are more, you know, uh, more prevalent in the patriarchal world that we actually have created, right? And we're not uh, embracing our feminine side. And so for me, it's really about that. Men have possess that too. And we need to see more of that if we are going to be successful in turning things around for the planet. And when I talk about feminine side, I mean, you know, our collective um, uh, collective value, uh, looking at things, you know, beyond just what it does for the self, but what it does for all of us. And, and we've lost that along the way. And that's what I was saying earlier. What distinguishes us from the rest of the animal world is that we've decided that half of what makes us human isn't important. <laughs> But it is, and that's why we're going wrong. And I think that's something we, we should, you know, it isn't about just putting women on a stage. It's about being authentic in our, you know, in our being, in, in who we are. And if we can do that, and if we can bring those perspectives to the table um, safely and, and, and not try to emulate what it means to be su successful, to make money quickly or whatever, then I think we, we stand a chance at turning things around. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well.
I think there's big danger in this male versus female. I fully agree with you. Yeah? We have to acknowledge that there are different personalities, different traits, uh, and then put up our values, which we believe are important. I think that is much more important than saying male or female. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and maybe just to, to illustrate, if, if I may, just an example of. of um, where feminine is important, um, or in the ocean space where I've observed it. So if I just now explained, you know, that there's the high seas, right? These are the areas beyond any, uh, beyond the, the jurisdiction of any one nation, right? That makes up nearly half our planet, 64% to be precise. That's almost half our planet, 64% of the ocean, that is ungoverned. Because when we developed the, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which tells us how we should manage and how we should protect our ocean, that was negotiated in the 1970s and in the 1980s, we did not think about anything beyond what the ocean could do for us as a nation, right? What does it do for me? It was more the sort of selfish approach rather than the collective approach. And in that process, we left out almost half our planet. And I strongly believe that if we had had more feminine perspectives, man or woman, feminine perspectives in that room, we would have discussed what the collective value is of the high seas, innate value of the high seas, the undiscovered value of the high seas, and we wouldn't have left it to be this wild west, which is now so vulnerable and, and open to extreme exploitation. I can't go into it here, but for example, deep sea mining is a, a looming threat for the, for the high seas. Uh, but so is you know, the fishing that I was describing. That can happen because there are no, there's no comprehensive framework for the high seas, because nobody cares, because they're not held accountable, because it doesn't belong to them. And that's where I think the feminine perspective would have really made a difference and can still make a difference in how we manage and govern and live in harmony with, uh, with the ocean. Thank you so much. This is uh, super important to say. So as you can learn, it's not an option, it's a necessity. And um, with that, I would like to include you as the audience, whether you have any questions to our panelists. Um, don't be shy. Uh, now is the moment. Um, not sure we can take also questions from, from online. Uh, Jimmy, probably not if there are any comments. No. We have a question here. Amy, Amy, because you're also working for UN. Um, because with Greta Thunberg, when she came in, not all politicians like her to be frank. How is the, this now going on? Are people like her and female now taking more serious? Do you see a trend going up or? I definitely think it was helpful to have someone that young and that brave being that visible going up against world leaders um, and, and speaking her mind. And I do think that as we move forward and we try to embrace the different sustainable development goals that the UN has, um, as long as we keep encouraging women to speak up, we will see more women doing that. Um, there's also, I think, more I think uh, the receptive uh, quality of, of seeing that happen now has increased, and so it's not so um, jarring. Uh, but at, at, again, I think another thing to mention in this conversation about women and female leadership is that we can only do so much if we don't have the proper allies, right? So some of our work is in helping um, our, our male counterparts understand uh, some guidelines on how to make sure we have trust put out a survey back in 2018 trying to do this review on women in sailing um, to learn about this and I think they uh, wound up surveying 4,500 people across 75 different countries and so the results of that were that 80% of, of the respondents felt like we need more work there are a lot of gender based issues in sailing and then 60% um, of them had said they had experienced some sort of discrimination some gender discrimination um, so the first step is really just making sure people understand that there is a problem. Uh, and then the, the second step was really just creating some guidance and um, documents around how to fix that. And so they, they've come up with like a toolkit that you can use uh, in different organizations. And the first step of it is really like surveying what's going on in your organization. How many members do you have that are female? What are their roles? Um, how many 
uh, people are on the race committee at a yacht club that are women? How many sailing instructors do you have? How many women actually own boats? Um, and so once you realize what the, the, the situation is in your own organization, that's the first step. And then the second step is coming up with programming and, and putting women in leadership roles so you can try to fix this. So we still have a long way to go, but I think we're, we're on the right path. Thank you. Any more questions? There's one. Well. There's one, sorry. There's yeah, one more. Okay. I think the, the other side is how do you organize your private life? Yeah? Because that's the big thing as well. If you look at the statistics, women in, in a lot of countries do double uh, as much at, as home in terms of minutes compared to, uh, to men, for example. And there are some countries where it's already different, especially in the Scandinavian countries. So one is this career thing and, and creating awareness, but the other then also is saying, how do I organize my life at home with children, with household, with, I mean, our population is aging, so I mean, I have to take care of my parents now as well. So how, how do I do all that? Yeah? And how do I organize myself? So that I'm happy, uh, the family is happy, my husband is happy. I think that's an awareness issue as well, if you ask me. So I think there are two coins in this whole thing, which in, in my uh, area now comes up quite a lot. Yeah, because a lot of men now also ask, I mean, how do we best do it? Yeah. There was one question over here. Yeah, please. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, the is, uh, uh, yeah, Resort. Uh, Yeah. It's, a, it's a similar question. Let's uh, ask the question again in 28 when we go around the world together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a super good question. Um, I think if you look at the ocean race now, it's all uh, male skippers. Yes. Um, but it's time for a change, and I think there's a uh, room to change. Uh, I think uh, more partners and more sponsors, they see the value of uh, I think having a female skipper too. Um, so I think that should be the future. It should be the future to have an uh, equal distribution and maybe have like a Boris campaign in Malicia and Rosalind's campaign in Malicia too. Uh, and uh, yeah, compete uh, against each other, train with each other and then uh, uh, compete. Um, but yeah, I think we are in the right way up, um, but we should, just should, should make it happen. Can, can, do you mind if I add something just from a non-sailor perspective but from the ocean conservation world? Um, what I, you know, and I think it, it, it applies across everything that the people that have the money, the people that have the power really to help support initiatives, whether it's uh, all female teams or in my, my world, whether it's projects, female led projects in conservation, is that uh, often those people are, um, are, are not like me, right? So they, they do not relate to me and my mission and what I'm doing. And so it's very difficult to get support. Um, from, you know, the, there's plenty of funding in the ocean conservation world, but it really only goes to projects that, uh, of, that are run by people that look like those that have the money. Yeah, that, that's the man. That's the man, right? Yeah. So, and I'm not a man, and I'm not a white woman, um, and I, it's really difficult for me to get funding. And I, you know, and I, am not, I know I'm not the only one. And so I think that if we, if we can really also make sure that we uh, can find those women or find those people that are, are open to supporting us um, in, in whatever endeavor we do, then I think we're, we're going to get there quicker where we want to be. So yeah, and, and I think you have like, the right people in crucial positions who really can make the decision, who has the money, uh, because now it's often, it's mad. I mean, Monica, you're here, that's super yeah. good, yeah. but we need more people like you on, on the critical positions. Just to add an Albright study, yeah, which shows that there are more um, men uh, named Thomas and Christian in leadership positions in Germany than women. Yeah? Uh, so they're all white, they're all, their name is Thomas and Christian. Uh, I mean, you, can, you can read the stats, uh, all right study. Uh, uh, it's, it's amazing. Yeah? I mean, we have more the same, and this, this is also 
a challenge in, in, uh, in our industry, yeah? because people tend to like people who are the same as you are. Uh, they don't want to have somebody who's different because it's more difficult to deal with them. Uh, and, and there are not a lot of people who are open to diverse teams. Yeah? Uh, and this is why I love your team, by the way. We have 11 nationalities. Yeah, so it's good. Uh, and I think that's crucial to acknowledge that you have to, you have to be open for different nationalities, different ways of doing things, and this is one of the challenges we have. You know? And it's again, it's not about men versus women. It's what's relatable to us, yeah. right? So, and that's what we need to somehow change. If we have more diverse people in leadership, diverse people with money, then there will be more diverse projects supported because all of us can be guilty of that, of being attracted to that which we can relate to. So. Can I add another thing that I think is equally important? I think it's also very important from the manufacturer brand perspective because a lot of times clothing and things and sailing are not made for women. Um, even the phallies, like that is such a hard thing for women to find, especially if you're not um, a slim woman, right? Um, or just even how we would use the bathroom. Like it's totally different than how men would use the bathroom when you're offshore like or even just day sailing and in difficult um, conditions and so I encourage I encourage us to think about it from a perspective of how things are made and designed um, and, and maybe that's just making sure that there are more women behind those decisions right like maybe brands and manufacturers need to spend more time recruiting um, more women to join their teams so they can think those things through. It's very difficult to understand these things if it's not an environment. It needs to be a market too. <laughs> like I, I spoke with Musto one week ago and I mentioned, I said, hey, it would be very nice to have like a woman-shaped uh, salo pet or whatever, just clothing. But they just said, yeah, there is no market. There, there are not enough women for us to make money Developing these kind of I have to respectfully disagree, only because I'm in these groups with all these women who are just dying for it. And I do, I will say to Send a context to me, then I'll say <laughs> okay. I, will, I will give Ms. Stowe that, that credit. They have started thinking those things through and designing differently. Um, but there is a huge group of women out there who would love to be recognized and thought of. And I think some of their marketing needs to be driven towards them. I think um, we need to just be thinking more about how we can um, not only create things for them, but also start uh, making sure we understand that they are a consumer. And, and anyone, especially on the boat side, a lot of times when boats are bought, uh, it's a lot of times the women who are the ones who control the money and the relationship, right, and can figure out if this can be financed or not. So we are actually part of this decision-making process at the very basic level of just even the boat side of it. Um, so I, I just think we need to be included and incorporated in, in, in more things. But let's team up on this yeah. and then go to Moostow. I'm already <laughs> speaking with them to yeah. design like a female line. Yeah, yeah, I would love that. Give it a year. <laughs> do that. And ask about the numbers because sometimes people use a lot of excuses. So it's also, I, I couldn't hire a woman because I, they didn't have the skills. And I'm like, where did you look? Yeah. <laughs> Who's yes. recruiting? Yeah. Who's recruiting? Yeah. Yeah. So how I, um, I, I had a headhunter the other day who said, uh, if I look at your um, advertisements, yeah, I mean, you have 20 bullet points yeah, describing what you want. No wonder you don't find a woman who says she can do it. Because men look at it and say, oh, I can do three of those. That's enough. Yeah. Men want to do all 20. Uh, and uh, uh, women want to do all 20. And they say, oh. And that's the same thing. Yeah, no, there's no market. No market? Uh, ask about the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> They're not asking. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same in the conservation world. Why I set up Women for Oceans was because I was always told when there was a manual, yes, but we don't know women that can cover this issue. And I thought, well, actually, I know more women than men in conservation. You just have to look for them. And so I set up this directory where you could search people, search her, you know, issue her, whatever, region and everything else, and name. So, Exactly to counter that argument. Yeah. I have one question from Boris. There you go. Yeah, to any of you, I was just curious to think and to see how you see the uh, connection between uh, gender equality and uh, climate, the climate crisis or climate action. Like, would we be in the same mess uh, if we had had more equality, or can we solve it quicker uh, if we if we had more gender equality? It's been a leading question already. <laughs> <laughs> Climate crisis, so what do you think? Is it? I mean, I, I, I think I tried to cover a little bit with the example about the high seas and how we would be developing policy and legislation 
if we had more sort of feminine perspective in that. Um, and with the climate crisis, it's all the same thing, right? I mean, the ocean is what's keeping us from the worst of the climate crisis at the moment. Uh, and as you know, we all know, women are um, um, disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. So they know what the issues are that they face, what the issues are that they're going to face, what their children are going to face. And so absolutely, I think by bringing their perspectives, our perspectives into that, um, again, that feminine perspective of thinking beyond me, but what is it that is going to do for my community and, and everything and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. I think that, that yes, absolutely, um, gender equality is essential for tackling the climate crisis. Uh, yeah. Others want to add? Oh, I would fully agree. I mean, um, if, I mean, that comes back again to women tend to get into action and solve problems more than men. Let's say that. Yeah? So I don't. I cannot. I mean, I have a lot of examples as well. But I mean, statistics so, show that action. Yeah? Um, if you, there's a problem, you have to do something. Yeah? Uh, men tend to discuss more and stay on the strategic level yeah? and don't. And this action. Missing a bit. So Women roll up their sleeves and just, just do it. Yeah. Get it. <laughs> so they're very action oriented, especially if, uh, I mean, if, I mean, sorry to put it like that, but we're deep shit, yeah, so we have to do something. Uh, yeah, I think it would be good, yes. I think also it starts with representations, right? So uh, when we look at the government's framework, when we look at the policy, I mean, it was like for years, decades, it was like very male dominated. Even in science, it was, it's like a Male domain, basically. Male, and you mentioned it earlier, Western. Western, yeah. which is also very important. Yeah. To, to, to but with, like when you go down, like like on regulation, for example, like take the ocean race as an example, and they have this this rule, this common rule, to have at least one female skipper on board. So that's the minimum, the bench line. It, would that be like something maybe like for the next ocean race to have uh, maybe fifty percent of female skippers on board? Would that make a difference? Mm, it's a good question. Um, but I think there should be no rule. I think, especially in this ocean race, we have proved that it doesn't matter if you're male or female. Last lack uh, on board Belizea, we still have 50 50 percent crew. Um, Biotem did the same. Um, I think it should be no rule. Uh, we've proven enough. Um, we should just continue to flow like this, and uh, that's it. More female skippers, for sure. Yeah. Okay. But incentives, maybe. Like, do we need incentives? That I, I, I think what we were talking about earlier is representation, right? We need those role models because that's going to accelerate having more diverse voices into any space, really. So that, I think, is, 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 is going to be key, whether that's sailing or whatever. But also, what is the aim of what you're trying to achieve, right. right? So, I mean, if there is no, like, in the sailing world, if there's, you know, we want to have more women sailors because we want to see women experience and have that opportunity equally, right? Um, it's a different incentive than, for example, in conservation, where it's absolutely essential that we have diverse voices, uh, you know, represented. Okay, I would like to, like, give the audience the chance for one more question. There's, like, an urgent question. Otherwise, if you have the chance, oh, anyway, like, we're going to stay here for some networking break, so, uh, you know, feel free. Um, I would like to thank you, especially you, for coming, showing up, and speaking up. Um, it was a pleasure to, to host this event and to, to debate with you. Um, I think we all learned a lot. Um, thank you so much. This was the last panel discussion that we have organized. Um, Ocean Race is almost over. Um, hopefully, we will be on the podium. Uh, sure. What's your guess? <laughs> we will be on the podium. <laughs> I think so too. Thank you so much. Thank you. to correct one thing that you were talking about earlier about the yeah. book, The Ocean and Us, right? Um, it is not about women in the ocean, just to be very clear about that. It is about the ocean, and it is about everything we can all do to help protect the ocean. It covers everything from shipping in the ocean. We have the author of that chapter in the room, actually, 
Um, it covers fish and the role uh, in the role of the carbon cycle and everything, the blue economy, uh, you know, the, the aquarium trade, marine animal welfare, which is a very important emerging topic. So it's not about women. It's just that there is a chapter which discusses uh, uh, the well. There's a chapter on gender and oceans, but also a chapter which is about. Uh, um, ensuring that there's better representation and what coloniality in the ocean space means and how we have taken a very Western-centric approach to, to tackling problems and so on and so forth. But the book is about the ocean first and foremost. And you can order it at theoceanandus.com. Thank, right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you guys. For Thank you.